Greetings, my name is Light, and this is a Gunfire Reborn tier list for Kyansu for Solo R8. We're going to be going through Kyansu's ascensions and uh, his blessings and talking about the hero. Uh, one thing you'll notice is that this tier list is much more simple than uh, some of the ones I've made in the past, um, and I can talk about that here in a second. But the most important thing is the way that I do tier lists is the tier list will be present on the left side of the screen starting now. If all you're looking for is a rather high quality tier list for how to play this character, feel free to pause the video and use this during your play. You can follow the tier list from top to bottom, left to right. If you're playing the punching build, you'd want to pick ascensions in this order, assuming you're offered them. And if you're wanting to play a melee build, this would be how you would pick those ascensions as well. At least that's my suggestion. Um, other than that, the turtle is a very versatile character and has a lot of overpowered stuff. So in general, if you're picking from these top two categories, uh, you're going to be doing very, very well. The main thing to keep in mind is that uh, most of the OP defense and OP offense abilities are best used when double tapping Aspis to get their effects. So double tap Aspis, this will turn on your unfathomable ocean, your hostile gift, your wave rider, this type of stuff, and you will be doing incredible amounts of damage. Normally I go from the bottom of the top to the tier list, but because I think the turtle is unique in, in, in his power level, I'm actually going to go from the top to bottom because I think it'll display a more comprehensive understanding of the character and will make a little bit more sense as I, as I talk about the character. Um, so without further ado, um, I don't think I have any other points that I'd like to say. So the first thing is, let's look at Kyansu's talents. Swelling Tide basically reduces Aspis' cooldown for all the remaining cooldown that you have, uh, minus 10% for every uh, one second of remaining cooldown. So if Swelling Tide has a cooldown of, um, how long is its cooldown? One sec. Uh, the cooldown starts at 10.5 seconds, uh, assuming you have your talent tree maxed. So uh, if you have, let's say, 8 seconds remaining and you uh, retract your tidal aspis once you have Swelling Tide, then uh, that will reduce it to a 2 second cooldown. So with a very small amount of, and, and, and uh, tidal aspis lasts uh, 5 seconds. With a uh, couple uh, instances of cooldown reduction or increasing the duration of Aspis, you can very quickly get to the point where Aspis can be activated and then uh, removed to do a large AoE damage and to gain all the effects that uh, happen after you cancel Aspis, of which there are many. Um, this character has a huge amount of shield, and shield is... And not only does he have a huge amount of shield, he has a very high shield percent recharge rate and a very fast shield delay, um, and he has high movement speed. All of these set him up to be already one of the best baseline characters in the game to have these type of stats. He's very tanky, and he has stats in the best places. Um, so uh, one would assume with uh, stats that are this high that his uh, ascension kit would be relatively weak because he has such high starting stats, but in fact that's not the case, and he also has some of the most broken ascensions in the game. Unceasing Flow is nothing special, getting one use of Striking Punch every two seconds. It does tend to come into play and when you're using the Punching build, and we can talk about that here in just a bit. Unshielded Force. Uh, retracting attack will be regarded as a striking punch, and that retracting attack is a large AoE hit, and it is quite useful. It's quite powerful. And then wild punch here, the 30% hurdle base damage for every level of the weapon you currently hold is very, very powerful in the late game, especially if you have a couple levels in, um, I think it's unbearable hurdle, uh, which uh, applies a multiplicative damage increase to enemies when you hurdle, and then uh, stuff, uh, blessings like, uh, um, like backfire here. Uh, also make Hurdle do uh, insane damage uh, in the late, in, in, in every stage of the game. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started in the OP defense category. The first ascension in the tier list is Ebb and Flow. Ebb and Flow says, after retracting the Aegis, your shield starts to recover immediately and receives a 50, after lifting or retracting the Aegis, you get a 50% shield recovery speed. This is sort of sleeper OP. And it wouldn't be as OP on any other character, uh, but 
the way that this character works, he already has such a high shield and he has such a high shield recovery rate that along with getting, you know, complete damage immunity from the front from Aspis and having an extremely low cooldown on Aspis, Ebb and Flow sort of rounds out all, mo or like rather most of the, of any problems this character would ever have when it comes to uh, survivability. Ebb and Flow, uh, you can lift your Aegis after you've taken damage and then you'll be basically at full shield and then when you drop it you're you're at full shield okay um if you're doing a double tap build this triggers a you get a, a short duration of in, invulnerability and you as a player get to decide how that lo how long that lasts uh which is very very powerful and then when you remove uh agus you're you are recovering shield at that time so if for as long as you can continue to not take damage you're basically still like healing up uh, a huge amount, especially with the shield recovery speed. Ebb and Flow is extremely powerful and probably the first pick ascension for this character. Next up we have Unfathomable Ocean and we specifically have level 1. Unfathomable Ocean is one of the best ascensions in the entire game. Um, this gives you a scaling amount of max shield for 5 seconds and at max level uh, also reduces Aspis cooldown um, for a shield that you lose. Uh, to be clear, the level 3 extra effect is very weak and doesn't really come into play very much, but plus 50% max shield is an incredible amount of shield. One second. So at level 1, this gives you 67.5 shield. Assuming you have your talent tree maxed, compare this to uh, the cat's um, uh, grenade, shield grenade, elemental shield I think is what it's called, which gives you 30 shield maximum. Uh, at its first point, and this is like more than twice as good, uh, th and this scales, but the grenade one doesn't, and the grenade one doesn't stack. Granted, the grenade one has a much better level 3, but I would take Unfathomable Ocean any day. Unfathomable Ocean is, oh, is incredibly overtuned, and because of the way that this, uh, these three first ascensions work, you can basically have 100% uptime on this, uh, this effect, uh, which makes it extremely powerful. Um, and keep in mind that as your max shield increases, the effective HP regen of your shield charging also increases as well. So as our max shield increases, ebb and flows, natural power increases, and uh, we get more and more powerful. Not only that, this uh, ascension here scales very well from 50, 100, and 150. At max level, it's giving you 202.5 shield, which is absolutely absurd with 100% uptime. Uh, should not be uh, disregarded. It is by far one of the best ascensions in the whole game, um, and it is uh, the the cornerstone of any any uh, build on this character, uh, no matter whether you're double tapping Aspis or not. Next up, we have Mighty Stream Level 1. Now, Mighty Stream Level 1 is rather innocuous, plus 2 second duration for Tidal Aspis, um, and that's all it gives. But the reason that we get this is because with one level of Mighty Stream, we get a 100% uptime on our double tap Aspis. The way that this works is because we've increased Mighty Stream uh, to 7 second duration for Aspis, and our cooldown is uh, uh, being reduced significantly because of uh, our talent tree. Um, it's gone, I think it's from 10.5 to uh, minus 25%, something like that. You're getting you're getting right around seven seconds, so you can tap, you can cast Aspis immediately, cancel it, and you can basically have Aspis up again or very very shortly after that. Um, uh, or oh, excuse me, I've misspoken. Sorry. Let me let me be 100% clear. Um, uh, basically, what this does is this makes it so that Aspis is ready once uh, Unfathomable Ocean is about to fall off, is about to no longer be effective. So you double tap Aspis, and then you have around four to five seconds, maybe three seconds, somewhere in there, where Aspis is on cooldown, but you don't need it because Unfathomable Ocean is currently triggered. You're in a very defensive state. Um, and as we'll see here with these OP def uh, offensive maneuvers, those things will also be active for just long enough for you to have Aspis back up right when you need it. Um, and Mighty Stream level 1 really just is all that you need to get that going. Um, which is interesting to note that it only really requires one ascension to do that because there are a myriad of ways for you to reset your cooldowns 
um, on this character, especially on Aspis. I would argue way too many. It's, it's almost unnecessary how many ways that you can reset the Aspis. So OP defense, starting with three ascensions, is ebb and flow, level one on that fathomable ocean, and then level one mighty stream, and then take... Um, unfathomable ocean as it's presented to you you don't really need more levels in mighty stream you can take them uh, they don't hurt they make the uh, they make it easier for you to double tap and for you to have it up longer uh, gives you a little bit more flexibility but ultimately just the first level is the really overpowered part next up let's move into the op offense category the first ascension in this category is unbearable hurdle which is one of the most overtuned ascensions in the game enemies hit by hurdle deal minus 30, 50, 80% damage, which is an incredible amount of damage reduction, and take 30, 40, 60, 30, 60, 100% multiplicative damage increase for five seconds. Uh, five seconds is a very long duration for such a powerful effect, and 100% multiplicative damage boost is almost unheard of on any ascension in the game, um, especially uh, because this applies in multiplayer as well, and uh, in multiplayer, uh, people are also getting this benefit. Compare that to Deathmark, which gives a 60% multiplicative damage increase, but only for you. You don't even get the, the and that's on the bird, Deathmark's on the bird. Uh, so Unbearable Hurdle is just absurdly broken. It is so good and fits in any build. Anytime that you can get a hurdle off on a boss or a stronger enemy and then start hitting them, you're going to absolutely melt them comparatively. Uh, had you not hit un unbearable hurdle on them. Uh, there's not a whole lot to talk about this particular uh, ascension, except for the fact that uh, it's extremely powerful. Next up for overpowered offense is Hostile Gift. Hostile Gift uh, basically does everything that you could ever need in one ascension and does it very well. When you retract the Aspis, recover a significant amount of ammo to the current magazine, so it has uh, no re reload synergy if you're doing like double tap with high magazine cap, um, like a plus two projectiles um, per kill, that kind of stuff, uh, and, uh, incre and uh, restores, there we go, a huge amount of your reserve ammo, even 20% reserve ammo is a massive amount. And then for the next, if that wasn't already enough, for the next five seconds you gain a massive reload and rate of fire increase, as well as at max level a 50% now to chance not to consume ammo. Um, I think just the fact that this is as long as it is is an indication that it uh, does a lot of, and the fact that all the things it does is really good um, can kind of indicate that this is extremely powerful. But let me give you a quick example. Uh, this is an angelic aura uh, base uh, stats uh, with nothing besides, uh, I've given it eight weapon upgrades, which actually doesn't impact this difference, um, but uh, with level three of hostile gift with just the rate of fire and reload time decrease of 60 and 60 percent that is a 100 percent multiplicative damage increase for that weapon which is absolutely insane if we just top take this down to the level one we are getting a 37 percent multiplicative damage increase which is uh, absolutely insane compare this to something like 40 percent weapon damage Oh, hold on. I haven't done this correct. Okay, actually I did, but it's just not a very good example. So ignore that 40% uh, base weapon damage increase. Uh, the biggest thing is that this rate of fire and reload time decrease uh, tend to be uh, some of the only rate of fire and reload increases that you're going to have on the weapon. That's not always the case, but they just tend to be a little bit more powerful than any damage increases because those are much easier to come by and they stack additively with each other. So in closing, Hostile Gift uh, gives you a very large damage increase on weapons. Uh, the That didn't include the 50% chance not to consume ammo, and it solves all of your ammo problems all in one uh, ascension, and even just one point in this is uh, extremely powerful. I will say Hostile Gift is not the best with melee weapons. I've experienced a lot of weirdness with uh, melee weapons attack speed. Um, uh, when using this particular ascension, but uh, not like not getting it at the right time. So just keep that in mind. Hostile Gift might not be the best way to go uh, on a melee build. But speaking of another overpowered ascension in the OP offense category uh, that actually does work well with melee weapons, we've got Wave Rider. Wave Rider is a 20, 30, and 40% move speed, which is already incredibly powerful. Okay, even if it just did that, that would be extremely good. Um, 
while holding the Asmus and for a long duration afterward, plenty of time for you to be able to reset it on average. And the, the next step is a permanent boost. So this is always uh, applying to you is my current understanding. For every 1% movement speed bonus, you gain plus one, plus 1.5, and plus two weapon and skill damage. This is incredibly powerful. So immediately, so at level, at level four, three, excuse me, this is giving you 40% move speed and 80% weapon and skill damage, but you are almost guaranteed to get a variety of other movement speed buffs. Say, for instance, that you're carrying a sword. A sword gives you a very large 30% base move speed buff, and uh, I think even more from the breacher talent from the talent tree. Um, those turn into weapon and skill damage, um, and uh, uh, the movement speed that you get automatically is already incredible. 40% move speed is as good as strategic advantage, which is the best scroll in the game. In my, the best scroll that I will pick that's in the game um, uh, from my uh, scroll tier list, uh, because movement speed is so incredibly powerful. So the fact that this gives you an immediate benefit, it has a permanent benefit that doesn't even have to. You don't even have to have wave rider buff on you. You don't even have to have the move speed active, um, and the scales. Uh, it makes it just absurdly powerful, uh, and it fits in a, a huge amount of builds, um, and uh, uh, just just really good. This can fit in basically every build that you do, and it is going to be very powerful. Next up, we have Irrepressible Surge, a ascension that I love to hate. Um, if an enemy is defeated while holding the Aspis, Hurdle will have no cooldown for the next two seconds. If an enemy is defeated within 1.2 seconds after retraction, Tidal Aspis will have no cooldown for the next two seconds. So basically what this says, we'll do the second part first. If an enemy is defeated after retracting Tidal Aspis, then uh, you, in a short duration, you can reactivate Tidal Aspis. So it's another way for you to set reset Tidal Aspis cooldown, okay? Um, the other thing is that uh, while you're holding the Aspis, getting one kill and doing something uh, you know clever with a couple levels of unbearable hurdle and maybe... Uh, backfire here, you can uh, actually just spam hurdle and kill the entire room. Now, the only issue with this particular ascension is that uh, it's limited, like your actual vision is the main limitation of this uh, ascension. So if you have like a really good map sense and you're paying attention to where you are and where, you, uh, where you're going, uh, you can use this to an extremely powerful effect. Uh, and I'd say it's even better in multiplayer. The biggest problem with it is that it's very hard to tell what you're doing. Um, and so for that reason, sometimes you can get yourself into a position where you get killed because you don't even know really what you're attacking. Uh, I hate this uh, ascension and don't think it should be in the game because playing Gunfire Reborn is about, uh, you know, looking at what you're doing and making decisions and sort of like trying to tactically move around the map and, and build a... a uh, uh, you know, like a strategy up, whereas this is literally just uh, spamming the same button almost blindly. You, you probably are best served looking at the minimap than the actual screen. Uh, really not my type of stuff. Next up, we're going to talk about the melee build. Before we get into these particular uh, ascensions that I've listed here, we need to talk about Libra Warrior and Rogue Wave. Libra Warrior says, uh, grants extra weapon damage, which is equivalent to 100% of the bonuses to Striking Punch. <sighs> Goodbye, kitty. By default, this sensation grants 5% Striking Punch per stack, which will also grant 5% weapon damage, but Rogue Wave can increase this bonus up to 20% per stack, which really means that you can, uh, with a couple levels of Rogue Wave in a melee build and the Libra Warrior, um, build, you can get your bonus damage to an insanely high uh, percentage. I haven't included it on this particular tier list because uh, I didn't make this tier list and I wasn't too excited about doing this tier list because I don't like this character very much. So I was pretty lazy about it and decided not to like re reinvent the wheel and use somebody else's. Whoever made this, thank you for doing that. It looks almost exactly like the ones I make. I love it. Um, but Keep in mind, if you really want to take full advantage of the melee build, Libra Warrior and getting levels in Rogue Wave above everything else are going to be one of the best ways that you can actually do almost any any weapon damage uh, build in the game. And once you have Libra Warrior, Dominating Fist becomes extremely powerful and should not be uh, 
uh, missed as an opportunity to get both of these two ascension at the same time, your weapon damage gets literally like stratospheric. The turtle does have a very good melee kit, and uh, that's very fun, and I love playing melee builds. If the character was a little less overpowered in general, I think I, I would really like the character because of this. Uh, the way that the melee build should be uh, generally used is starting out with formidable aspis. This says on retracting the aspis, gain uh, a plus percentage of weapon damage, and at level 3 you get lucky shot for the next 3, 4, 5 shots. Each enemy killed reduces the cooldown of Tidal Aspis by a certain amount. Now, I will say that in my uh, imaginary patch notes, I suggested that this uh, change from a cooldown reduction of Tidal Aspis to a reduction of your dash, so that you can hit someone and then dash very quickly to the next target and sort of chain targets together, which I think would be a lot more fun and enjoyable. Well, there's already way too many ways to like reset Tidal Aspis, um, and Tidal Aspis is probably the least interesting part about this character. Uh, as it's very, very straightforward. Um, so uh, just to keep that in mind. Um, but as it stands, it's very, very powerful. Um, keep in mind that this works exceptionally well with any weapon that sh fires multiple shots with one click, because that often takes, uh, or multiple projectiles or shots like with one click, because this bonus damage will apply to all of those hits and not because it's just one shot. So the best example of this is uh, Flowing Light, secondary ability, which will do five hits, but it will only consume one charge of Formidable Aspis, and so you'll be getting plus 100% damage on all five of those hits, only costing you one charge of the Ascension stack. Uh, this is sort of the bread and butter for damage for these uh, melee builds, because in general you're hitting fewer times with melee than you would be with a weapon, and so this allows you to really take advantage of some some high damage hits when it really matters. Next up we have something that might be surprising. I have level 1 battle adrenaline on the melee build pretty highly. Um, every, every time an enemy dies within 10 meters, you gain weapon damage and movement speed for 8, 8, and 10 seconds up to 5 stacks. And then at max stacks, uh, you, can, you can hit an enemy to gain a stack, which makes it stack up way, way faster. This ascension uh, provides quite a bit of benefit for a very low cost at level 1. You can get up to 20% move speed, up to 50% uh, damage, and uh, all for one point in ascension. And I think it just does a good job of sort of rounding out some of what you need in a melee build without getting too uh, caught up in um, uh, you know, maximizing your damage perfectly. The next two levels I have at the end, but I think the first level is really worth picking up. I highly suggest it for these builds. Next up, we've got Concussive Current. Concussive Current says after dealing damage with a striking punch, um, increase your weapon damage uh, by a certain amount, and at max level gives you a little bit of lucky shot for each stack of Fist Sensation for, three, for 6, 6, and 8 seconds. Now, I wish that these durations lasted a little longer, but that being said, with something like Dominating Fist that gives you a, a large amount of stacks of Fist Sensation even when you're not moving, um, Concussive Current works very well, but the biggest reason that Concussive Current is so good is that you're very likely to have a large amount of stacks of uh, Fist Sensation because the melee build causes you to move around so, so much. This first point of this ascension works really well, and it is absolutely worth getting more to really, really stack your damage up. It's very easy to uh, weave in punches with your melee attacks, excuse me, especially with something like the Fire Tower uh, or the Flowing Light attack combo the six hit combo um, and uh, it works very very well it's a it's a seven hit combo sorry about that all right next up is maybe another one that might surprise you but i think solid shell is a little bit better than most people give it credit for 10 meters is actually a pretty fair amount and this gives you minus five five percent ten percent fifteen percent damage for damage taken for every enemy within 10 meters this really allows you to sort of charge in to a group of enemies and be really, really tanky, especially with some clever usage of Aspis. Um, Solid Shell is an underrated ascension um, and works very well in this uh, particular ascension path and the damage return ascension path. Um, it gives you a lot of damage reduction, um, especially when there's a bunch of small enemies. It's kind of worth keeping them around because if you have like six beetles around you, uh, that's essentially six minus 60% damage taken. Um, and you can just really like easily run around the beetles if you're you know playing smart um 
works very, very well. So Solid Shell's definitely worth picking up in the melee build. I highly recommend it. After that, we really want to just focus on doing uh, maxing out the most important ascensions next. That's Formidable Aspis. We really want that juicy damage on more shots. That's really going to help us out a lot. Then we want to go back for a second level of Concursive Current, keeping that damage going. I, re I recommend another level of Solid Shell, even Solid Shell level 3. I just, because I didn't make this tier list, I can't like add the same uh, image to the tier list again, which is lame. And probably my the only thing I really don't like about this tier list is that I wasn't able to add the blessings and then re-add the same image to different uh, sections. Um, what can you do? Um, then we want to max out uh, uh, concussive current, and actually that's a slight mistake. Cus concussive current level three should obviously be like further up ahead because we want to prioritize three above like two and stuff like that. Um, so this could probably go somewhere like right there. It's not a big deal. And then once we've done that, um, we can go back for battle adrenaline for even more damage and move speed. Keep in mind that the melee build works uh, incredibly well with unbearable hurdle, with uh, rogue wave plus libra warrior, and with uh, wave rider. So these were not included in the melee build. Um, but those three should always be picked before anything in the melee build because they are actually more impactful for the melee build than the melee centric stuff because they're so broken. All right, I think that covers the melee build. Next, let's move on to punching. First things first, the, I don't know, this is probably pretty obvious to anyone who's played this character a lot, but the biggest thing about the punch build is that it's very easy to A, run out of punches. Your damage is actually not super, super high. Um, and if you get wave breaking blow a little too early, you can actually just run out of punches because you're not doing enough damage to kill something. Um, so let's cover some blessings really quick. I'd say that most people think that uh, dominating fist is probably the best way to go um, as far as this uh, uh, build is concerned. And that does help you almost always uh, do a maximum four hit wave breaking blow. Okay, so that is good and it does improve your punch damage. But I'd make the case that Skill Freak is probably the most consistent um, ascension to take uh, because of the 100% multiplicative damage increase. The real limitation of the punch build is not, um, it is actually damage. It can be kind of hard to get enough damage to kill things consistently. So, uh, uh, you know, that's something to consider. Uh, as far as uh, the OP offense category for the punch build, the unbearable hurdle is insanely good, and uh, Wave Rider is also insanely good in the punch build. That being said, the punch build does require a lot of things to get set up, so let's talk about it. First things first is Stormy Riptide. I think this is the, you really need at least one level for the punch build to really work. What this says is, upon every use of striking punch, recover duration of tidal aspis when shielded. And reduce the cooldown when unshielded and i guess at max level it uh doubles the effect the reductions or increases if an enemy is killed with striking punch okay so that's good but the idea here is even with just one level of stormy riptide you can make your aspis last a really 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 long time and early game when you don't have a huge amount of ways to get uh, punches back what this does is takes advantage of unceasing flow which gives you one use of striking punch every two seconds. All right, let's move on to wave breaking blow, which is the second part of uh, the punch build. Every eight stacks of fist sensation will consume one additional use of striking punch upon casting it and perform an additional punch with plus 40% damage. Um, well, I think it's, is it plus 40% or like reduced to 40%? Looks like it's reduced to 40%. So, um, if it kills an enemy, you recover all the uses consumed. So that is why it is so good, uh, is because it, it A, can potentially add 120% damage because of that, that's four, three additional 40% uh, damage punches. Um, and it can recover all the uses that it would uh, otherwise extra consume. Well, the cool thing about the Stormy Riptide plus Unceasing Flow combo with once you have Wave, wave Breaking Blow is that uh, even if you just have one point or like one um, uh, 
a charge of punch, you can trigger wave breaking blow to do multiple hits. So you really only need one punch to like get maximum benefit out of wave breaking blow, assuming you have enough fist sensation to actually trigger those extra hits. So that's one of the reasons that Stormy Riptide is, is incredibly powerful in this particular build. And one point of Stormy Riptide is kind of something you can splash into just about any build because it just basically allows you to extend the duration of Aspis for as long as you need it to be extended to. Um, and I'll talk about that more in the damage return build. After we get Wave Breaking Blow, one point in Clenched Fist is very good. Clenched Fist is your base damage increase for Striking Punch, which is which is a multiplicative damage increase. So this gives you 100, 200, and 300 base damage. And at max level, a 50% extra Striking Punch damage to enemies whose HP are higher than 75%. So basically, it gives you like an extra multiplicative damage increase on enemies that are near or at full HP. And it's... A little bit better uh, at the first phase on bosses for that reason. Um, that being said, the first point of it is really, really impactful because you will get that juicy uh, multiplicative damage increase. And if you've gone for the skill freak ability, you're going to see your damage really spike up at this point. Speaking of damage spiking up, we've got Rogue Wave. Rogue Wave is the main way that this build starts to get crazy, crazy damage. Um, I do think the other three ascensions are something you should choose over the first level of Rogue Wave, but Rogue Wave really is your sort of like late game scaling. Once you get your build really going and you're moving fast, you have a lot of fist sensation and you're punching a lot, Rogue Wave does crazy damage. And what it does is each stack of fist sensation increases the next striking punch up to 10, 15, and 20%. You gain stacks up after using Hurdle and at, at level 3 increases the stack duration of fist sensation in general to 3 seconds. Now normally fist sensation decays after 2 seconds here. Uh, so this is a 50% increase in the duration of fist sensation and should not be underrated. That is a massive buff because fist sensation stacks decay independently. So increasing the duration of them significantly means that the total fist sensation that you can have at one time gets increased a lot. A lot. Okay, so Rogue Wave, really, really important for our late game punching damage. Next up, we've got Dark Tide. Dark Tide is the, uh, like, number of charges increased for this particular skill build it gives you i've got level one here uh a little bit earlier on in this list um it gives you plus five striking punch capacity there's a 50 percent chance to recover one use of striking punch each time you use it when you're holding the aspis i'm going to make the case that in general if this build is going well uh like level one dark tide is kind of all you need but level two can be really good you I will, I will make the case that level 3 is almost never worth it. So like level 2 gives you 10 extra punches and have a 60% chance to consume 50% of the used punches regardless of whether you kill. So like if you kill with wave breaking blow and you trigger dark tide, you, you might get like 6 charges back, right? And like that's almost more than enough to like never run out, assuming you're doing legitimate damage. But at max level, you basically have infinite punches. 70% chance to consume one to recover 100% of the consumed usage and wave breaking blow will also refund you the, the uses if you kill something it just gets absolutely insane uh, but level two is quite good um, and that's why I've got it here in the punch build once we've got our first level of dark tide we can pop back for rogue wave to start stacking up our late game damage and then get clenched fitch which is more impactful early if you're struggling earlier it might be worth picking up a couple levels of clenched fist over rogue wave because that might be more impactful for you then we can go back for stormy riptide so that our tidal aspis lasts basically as long as we have punches um, and dark tide pickup at uh at the end here will be really 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 powerful um, and I think that covers everything in the punch build as far as I understand it. Uh, next up, we've got the backfire damage return build. Uh, the blessing that you'd want to pick for the damage return build is backfire. This reflects a significant AoE of damage back to all enemies within 10 meters upon taking damage or hitting an enemy with hurdle. Um, uh, now, keep in mind, when it says or hitting an enemy with hurdle, what this means is it just makes hurdle do AoE damage. The hurdle damage is fundamentally not tied to any damage that you would take to the Aspis. The base damage is equivalent to the monster's damage that they would have done, multiplied by 60, and then gets boosted by any skill and general damage. Um, works even when you take no damage, like when Tidal Aspis is active, does not work from self-inflicted uh, damage, 
and hurdle damage is not multiplied by 60. It just makes that hurdle damage do AoE damage, right? Um, importantly, backfire will trigger even if you don't... <coughs> Excuse me. Backfire will trigger even if you don't have um, Aspis up. So if you just take damage uh, while you're chilling with no Aspis up, it will do the AoE damage return. The biggest thing with backfire is how you can abuse hurdle, though. Um, it's very important to remember that hurdle... Uh, damage increases based on the uh, level up weapon that you currently hold. So the backfire build works very, very well with levels of irrepressible surge for infinite hurdles and uh, with uh, um, unbearable hurdle because it's applying that multiplicative damage increase to enemies. When you don't, when you're not able to get a crazy combo of hurdle damage going, uh, you can actually just chill and you let your return fire do massive amounts of damage. And uh, trust me, this build is extremely powerful and should not be underrated. It is it is le very legitimate and high R8. So the first ascension that we're looking for is white water. Each block of the Aspis reflects a small, decent, or huge amount of damage, which decreases gradually when getting further away from monsters. At level three, each block will cause 2,000 normal damage to enemies within 10 meters after retracting the Aegis. So, the way that you use white water is not maybe as straightforward as you would think. There are certain enemies and bosses that really take a lot of damage from white water, but not all of them do. The way that you play the damage return build is by finding specific enemies, excuse me, finding specific enemies that take huge amounts of damage from white water, killing them to trigger um, irrepressible surge so that you have infinite hurdles. And then using Backfire's Hurdle Damage with levels in uh, unfathom, excuse me, Unbearable Hurdle to do massive AoE damage and sort of clear out all the small people. And then find that next person who takes a lot of damage from white water and sort of repeat the process. Enemies that take a lot of damage from white water include enemies that do large, like significant amounts of hits in a row. Um, so... Any corrosive enemy, you actually counter them with the Whitewater build because they do lots of ticks of damage, which means each tick is returning damage to them and doing AoE damage because of backfire. Um, once you get that kill on them, then you start hurtling and doing massive hurdle damage in an AoE, and you can clear the map sometimes with just hurdle by doing that. Other enemies are flamethrower guys, um, ice thrower guys in, in, in the, the penguins. Um, Rogue arsonists are the flamethrower guys. Um, rogue bandits are... Uh, I think that's what they're called. No, no, no. Rogue enforcers. <laughs> the shotgun guys in the Anxi Desert. Um, the uh, squids, octopuses in uh, the docks. <laughs> oh, jeez. Um, uh, kappas are also pretty good. Uh, any, any, there are actually quite a few catfish, uh, archer people. Um, anytime they, any, any enemy, and oh, annihilation monks. That's another good one uh, because they do those multiple ticks of damage. There are a lot of enemies that basically white water just almost insta kills them. Um, and it, and if you know what you're looking for, you know what each enemy does and how to counter them, then white water gets you that first kill. And then you just hurdle through the rest of the enemies. And then on bosses, certain bosses also take huge amounts of damage from white water. Ichisaurus, um, gets absolutely murdered by white water and backlash because, uh, you can just stand in his beam, take no damage and do huge damage back to him. Um, uh, wind God does not work well. Um, there's nothing the Wind God does that works good with this particular build. Um, uh, the uh, Ghost Ship can be okay. You can stand and take damage from the cannons uh, in the first two phases. That works okay. Um, the Snake Boss is really tough against this particular build. The Bear is uh, not bad, um, especially because you take AoE damage from the Bear um, during the... Uh, 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 what am I trying to say, during the DPS check phase. So if you just stand right next to him and just hold Aspis and punch, uh, the little bits of damage he does will actually kill him, uh, which is really cool. Uh, especially if you're, you know, uh, I think you can spam Hurdle on him too while that's happening uh, because Hurdle has no cooldown and that's plenty of damage to kill him during the DPS phase. 
Um, and Luwu, nothing special there. Um, and the Golem is only okay. Uh, you know, there's nothing like you can block all the rocks, but I'm I I do think yeah, I think the rocks work. So you can block all the rocks, and uh, uh, that would return damage to him too. So Whitewater is a knowledge based build, but it does work very well. So we've talked about Whitewater. Let's move on to Solid Shell. I will get, make the case that Solid Shell also fits very well in this build. The main thing you want to be doing is sort of like standing in the middle of a bunch of enemies because that's going to allow people to hit you with Whitewater and is going to cause the area effect damage from backfire to actually do damage. Um, so sitting in a bunch of enemies makes Solid Shell a really good pick. And you might say, well, Slight, you don't need it because you can, you're can you basically invulnerable. Well, it can be pretty... It, the, the idea here is this lets you position more freely. And positioning is everything with this build. The closer you are to enemies, the better. And so if you're constantly having to stay like five meters back just so that nothing gets behind you, uh, because you're going to die if something gets behind you, then you actually can't take full advantage of the build. So Solid Shell allows you to play a lot more, a lot less carefully and really just sort of go into enemies' um, areas and like, you know, do it, do a huge amount of stuff there. Um, this is a, a build that can be, be benefited by one level of Stormy Riptide or a couple levels because just punching keeps your Aspis going for longer and longer, and that can be very useful. Um, as well as levels in Mighty Stream is doing sort of the same thing where you're getting extra duration on your Tidal Aspis. Um, and, and you know, that adds up to a significant amount of uh, Aspis time. It means you have Aspis pretty much anytime you need it. And uh, I'll say that it works really, really well. So that covers the damage return build. Let's go over to the meh category here. There's not much that this character has that's not very good, to be honest. And Tidal Rhythm is actually quite good. It's just, fine 40 80 120 skill damage when holding the aspis 120 weapon damage for five seconds after each block grants an additional 10 percent weapon bonus damage bonus um you know it's okay nothing special really straightforward you can pick it if you if you don't have anything else that fits in your build the chances of you you know having to pick it depends on what you're doing but it works with every build so it's fine and lastly, we've got Dark Tide level 3, which I think is a bit overkill. You don't really need it. I could be wrong about that. Um, but in my experience, I haven't really needed it with the punch build. You know, there's, and usually I, if I'm, usually I can get something that helps me with charges, like um, uh, from like a scroll or another blessing, that kind of stuff. <clears throat> so I think that covers the turtle. I think he's really easy to play. I think he's really straightforward. I think he has the most amount of OP things uh, compared to any character. Um, and I think his punch build is actually uh, harder to play than just going for like basic normal stuff. You know, just find a good weapon and abuse double tap. Uh, I think you're you're going to be just fine. Very easy to win. Anyway, that does it for me. Uh, let me know if you think I missed something. Let me know if uh, you think I could uh, I uh, this could be improved in any way, or if you uh, disagreed with any of my points. I would love to hear your thoughts. And without further ado, uh, I'll see you in the next one. Thanks.